module, uh, we will basically try to take a very brief look at uh, what kind of commands are available for us to do printing uh, and also uh, doing uh, some sort of syncing uh, between two different uh, machines uh, which are connected over the network. So, it could be either a, a local area network, a LAN network or over a, a wide area network over the internet. So, in Unix, uh, the printing is actually mechanism by which multiple uh, users uh, could actually be submitting multiple jobs from multiple machines on the network to different printers that might be available on the uh, network. So, a printer could actually be connected uh, directly to a system uh, in which the, the printer would be useful only for printing from that particular system as far as Unix is concerned. But here, you could also have a printer connected uh, on the network by which all the machines in the network could also be uh, using the same printer to fire the print jobs and then get their uh, uh, files or data uh, printed. So, as far as the, the Unix is concerned, predominantly it is actually uh, takes into account that the, the printer machine is an independent system that is actually connected on the network and uh, over the network we will be able to fire jobs uh, uh, to be printed onto the printer device. So, some of the, the printing related commands that we need to be aware of, uh, I have a variable called uh, environment variable called as a printer, uh, which basically sets uh, what is the default uh, printer on the uh, system that I want to set it to. So, I could actually make use of the export uh, shell command to set the, uh, the printer uh, value appropriately. Now, after I have given this uh, and set it. Uh, I, I can actually use the command called LPR, uh, which will basically send the given files to, a, to the specified uh, printing queue, wherein I say LPR minus P Q uh, if I need to be specific to the queue and then followed by whatever are the list of files that I want to be uh, printing. So, this files could either be uh, in the plain text format. So, uh, any kind of a file that could be opened up with the normal text editor that we had seen in the previous module could be here. or uh, most of the printer drivers on the uh, Linux system also accepts uh, files to be given in the postscript format. So, typically files that are ending with the .ps extension, right. If you actually try to give files with any other format or any kind of other data representation, uh, we will find that uh, we, we will get only garbage uh, or rather uh, non-printable characters uh, or non-readable characters getting printed onto my uh, printer. Right. So, sometimes uh, it also has the potential uh, to uh, sort of uh, make, uh, I mean have a requirement that my printer driver itself uh, needs to be uh, possibly restarted uh, to make it start behaving properly after sending uh, this kind of non-supported uh, text to the printer device. So, if I uh, basically uh, have to give any other format uh, uh, on some of the distributions, I could also have a command called A2PS. Uh, which basically stands for any to postscript and uh, if that particular format is capable of getting converted to a postscript format transparently, uh, this command will try to uh, change the format to a postscript format and then fire the printer job on the specified queue, right. So, in that way th there is possibility that we might be still able to get the job, get the file printed out, uh, but there are only certain basic formats that are supported by this particular command even if it is actually available on your uh, distribution. So, we could we cannot have all kinds of uh, uh, data formats uh, getting converted into a postscript format by this uh, and then subsequently getting printed also successfully. So, if I want to really find out uh, how many different jobs are there uh, on my queue, I could actually use the LPQ command uh, which will list me all the different jobs that are pending on the queue and uh, which user has actually fired it and so on and so forth, right. So, it also tells me for example, what is the total size of uh, the bytes that, that, that needs to be printed as part of that particular job. So, looking at it, if I, if I decide uh, that I would like to cancel a particular print job, uh, assuming that that particular job has not been already started in the printer device, I could run the cancel command to cancel the job or sort of remove the job from the queue. So, I could say cancel the job number and uh, that particular job will be getting removed. So, for example, in this output if you find that the second job is, is, is like sort of going to be a very large uh, uh, size, 
uh, close to like around 65 MB, uh, which possibly the user might have given it out uh, by mistake. And if the administrator decides that this particular job needs to be cancelled uh, because it has been given by mistake, so he can use a cancelled job and then uh, give the job number for it, and then automatically this particular job will be getting deleted from the, from from my uh, print queue. So I could also uh, convert a postscript uh, file into a PDF file uh, so that uh, uh, it becomes easier uh, with a wide uh, range of fonts that I will have with the PDF format. So I could use a ps to pdf uh, command to convert a postscript file to a pdf file, open up the pdf file uh, with any kind of a pdf editor like an xpdf or acroread depending on the, the particular application that has been installed, uh, pdf application that has been installed on, this, on, on the system. And then from, uh, from that particular uh, pdf application I could also fire. Uh, the print job so that I will be able to get it uh, the printer print out in a much more uh, neat format with lot of uh, uh, fonts that are actually available in the PDF uh, form. So uh, if I do not have a PDF form, PDF uh, application, PDF reader application, uh, I also have an option by trying to convert uh, that PDF file into a postscript file uh, by using the command called PDF to PS uh, and then firing that postscript file into my printer queue for getting in printed. So either way we have uh, options to basically have the content uh, printed out. So now coming into uh, the next uh, command for uh, syncing a file across a system across the network into another system which is actually connected either in my local area network that is a LAN or over the internet. Uh, there is a very powerful command called as rsync, the rsync stands for uh, remote sync. So, what this actually tries to do is it tries to uh, sort of sync up uh, two directories on two different machines which are typically connected over a very low bandwidth connection. Now, what this actually does is I basically try to do a complete copy of one directory. So, typically uh, in practical environment uh, what really happens is when I have a directory uh, which is having let us say lot of contents in it uh, running into uh, maybe like MBs or GBs of data which I want to be which I have a requirement to keep updating. So, some part of my directory uh, is going to be getting updated, but I have a requirement to be very safe and have a requirement that I need to have a copy of this entire directory available on another machine. right? Uh, which is actually connected uh, maybe let us say remotely uh, over the internet and my bandwidth connectivity that I have between these two machines is very low. right? So, in this kind of a scenario I have my I have a requirement that has been put forward to me that the directory contents in the local machine should be getting continuously updated onto the remote machine and I have a very low bandwidth connection between the two machines. Right? Now, that is basically where a very powerful syncing utility like rsync comes into play. Now, what does this rsync actually uh, does is, so we said I could be able to copy the directory contents from one machine to another machine and because the directory in a typical scenario where I am employing rsync to be used will contain lots of files, rsync has internally got the capability to identify what files have got changed and only copy those files across to the remote system. And that too it will not copy the entire file content, but will only transfer the blocks that differ within a particular file on the local system and the remote system. So, it has a mechanism by which it will be able to detect first which files have got changed number one, number two among the changed files identify what are the data blocks that has actually got modified and only transfer those data blocks across to the remote system. And it also has one more advanced feature where that data is also compressed and the compressed portion of the data is what is actually sent over the connectivity to the remote system. Now, we were just discussing that typically this command will be used. Uh, will be very useful when we really have a very low bandwidth connection. 
now you will be able to understand better why we are telling specifically about the low bandwidth connection because uh, when, a, when I have a load bandwidth connection, I need to basically optimize on how much of data that I am really trying to uh, transfer over that connection for me to effectively make use of it. So, when I have a utility that is not blindly going to transfer the entire directory contents uh, across to the remote system every time I want to sync, right? which would essentially mean that I am going to be occupying the entire bandwidth and because it is very low bandwidth, I am also going to be ending up spending a lot of time for this whole transfer to complete. What we are ending up doing is our sync is that it is going to modify, it is going to transfer only the modified files. Within the modified files, it is going to only transfer the data blocks that has been changed as compared to the previous transfer that was done onto the remote system. And again, one more advanced feature more than this feature is even those data blocks I will be able to compress so that effectively uh, as we had seen in the previous module when I compress my size is going to become drastically lesser because the size is becoming drastically lesser I am going to take that much extremely less amount of bandwidth on my connect connectivity to be sending it across to the remote system. Right? So, uh, this is something that will be very very handy uh, when, I, when I have a requirement that I want to have one huge let us say a directory repository on my local system to be backed up onto a remote system uh, which, which, is, which is actually having a connectivity with the, with the local system in a very, very uh, uh, low bandwidth capacity. Right? So, this is, this is something which could be typically used uh, with the uh, uh, secure shell which will have an added advantage that the data when it is actually going even the compressed data that is actually going over the network will be protected by sort of encrypting the data at the time of transmission and decrypting the data at the time of uh, the receiver by the remote system. Right? So, how do I actually make use of it? Uh, I specify R sync minus A. So, uh, I specify first uh, what is the location that I want to uh, take the, the, the source data for backing it up and I destination location I specify. But in this, in this particular case, both the source and the destination has actually been given as the same machine. But in a typical scenario, uh, you will find that the destination machine is a different machine uh, and we will see an example in the next slide. Right? So, when we say archive mode, uh, we basically say that uh, we want to take an archive of the entire source and then sort of sync it up to the destination location. Right? So, when we say uh, PAV and then also use the delete, when we say PAV, uh, if for example, I was I have been able to transfer uh, only uh, part of the uh, file and as part of the transferring this file, I had a downtime on the network link, I will basically keep the partially transferred files for me to restart the transfer from wherever I had left once the network link comes back up again. Right? So, uh, these are some options that I could actually make use of with the rsync command to make it uh, more uh, powerful. Now, if I use the minus delete option also in the command line, uh, this will also enable, so this will also delete the files in the target uh, which is not actually existing in the uh, source machine right now. So, when will this scenario come in? When I have taken a backup of the directory today for example, in which my directory contain 10 files. So, all these 10 files would be actually getting backed up on the remote system or on the remote location. Tomorrow, if out of this 10 files, 2 files have been removed in my source system, minus delete option if I use the rsync command and uh, I run the rsync command today, what it will really do is these 2 files that have been deleted in the source today will also be getting deleted in the target location. right? Uh, so, if I do not use this minus delete option, the deletion of the files is the target to make it completely in synchronization with the source will not be done. So, if I have to copy it to a remote machine, uh, what we actually do is we specify the source location here and then specify what is the remote machine location. So, if you find uh, here, it has been given as bill at one particular uh, domain name. Right? Now, what does this actually mean is that? bill is the user on this particular system colon followed by the location. Right? So, what we are actually trying to convey is 
this is the source location on my local system from which I am trying to run the rsync command. I want to take the contents of this particular directory whatever is there currently and copy it into a remote location. Now, what is the remote machine? The remote machine is www.score.com. Okay. On the remote machine, where should I copy? I should copy it as bill user, user bill. It is right now expected that the user bill is a valid user on that particular system. As user bill, what is the location in which rsync has to copy? It has to copy into this particular location. right? So, whatever are the contents of this location slash home slash bill slash legal slash arguments will now be copied into the location slash home slash legal slash arguments on this particular machine remote machine www.score.com as user bill. Right? Now, when this command is run because this user local user is trying to copy as user bill the rsync command will prompt for the bill's password to be typed on the remote system. So, only after the password for the user bill on this remote system is typed, the rsync command will actually go ahead with the copy. So, if by chance the user is typing a wrong password for the user bill, then rsync command will basically fail saying that authentication has not been successful. Right? On the other hand, if I want to try to do it with SSH as we were discussing in the previous slide. So, SSH is basically a mechanism by which the data transfer will happen in a, in a very uh, secure manner where the data will be sort of getting encrypted before it is actually put onto the network and on the receiver system, on the remote system as soon as it is retrieved, received the data will be decrypted before it is actually stored on to the destination location. So, if I really want it to be very secure, rsync also has a mechanism by which I can say that I want this data transfer to be made uh, whenever it is done over a secure mechanism by using this particular option of E. Thank you.